Welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's story is from the incredible mind of our brother from another mother, Mr. Michael G. Lockhart. And as ever, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. Well, it really does help out the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story. Entitled Off the Guardrails. Let's get straight into that. Dimitri peered into the ever darkening gloom as twilight faded into early evening. The day had become overcast and grey, and despite the spring flowers that managed to eke out of existence along the narrow shoulders of the roadway, and the various verdant hues of new leaves attached to the sparse trees and brush, the landscape managed to appear dreary and forlorn. Perhaps it was the bleak outline of buildings in the near distance. The encroachment of humanity into a tiny stretch of nature that stubbornly remained along Little Jordan Bayou. He switched on his wipers as the rain that had threatened most of his journey finally arrived. The wind had whipped at his car the entire time, tugging him towards other vehicles, the verges of the roadway, and buffeting his small car so that he maintained a tight grip on the steering wheel. He considered that the intermittent gale spread pollen and growth, despite the dead coverings of concrete and asphalt. And the fierce winds now drove a heavy downpour, and sheets of rain accompanied each blast of air. He slowed as the water scrubbed the last of the yellow-green pollen from his vehicle. Ahead, he caught sight of a yellow reflector. He knew that the guard rail for the bridge that spanned the bayou, once a small river, was festooned with various rectangles of reflective yellow, red and white, and dire warnings of ice that might form in winter months. His vision stared at bright lights that, that rode high above the pavement and wide apart, when a large frame rolled directly towards him. He could now make out a red cab in the feeble light available. The lights had crossed into and remained in his lane. He flashed his bright headlamps and slammed onto the horn to no avail. At the last moment, he ditched the car into the opposite lane to avoid the imminent head-on collision with the far heavier and larger mass of metal that hurtled onwards, its driver oblivious to the elements of the roadway or anything other than the amusing text to his government. Dimitri felt the various impacts as his car slammed into the guardrail. It was an older one. It had fewer crumple zones and more of it sliced into his little roadster that would be the case with the newer models that were designed to absorb impacts. He found himself falling and then landing and rolling for an inordinate amount of time. He finally came to a halt against the heavy roots of an ancient willow far down the embankment. And the world went monochrome for a period and then washed through shades of grey before it finally began to resume normal hues and sounds once again, penetrating his ears and alerting him to life in the world. He truly awakened to the excruciating pain in his chest and left arm. The arm quickly began to go numb, and eventually, the misery in his chest faded to a dull throb. He found that his left numbed arm would not cooperate, despite direct orders, and so he used his right hand to open the driver's side door. Must have been laying on it. Oh, it's getting tingly, he mumbled. The hinges of the little car squealed in protest that they'd been strained and beaten unreasonably. He got his left foot out of the vehicle and into the mud, and then stopped for a moment to inspect his situation with other senses before he touched anything else. It was full on night, and so he must have been there for a while. The rain and wind had blown on to other climbs. And then he listened. There were no noises from the highway above. He looked to where he assumed the roadway rested, but it was no longer visible in the waning light. The hideous yellow-orange glow that typically washed out any natural view of night sky anywhere near the city was not present. Instead, the vault of heaven lay above, painted with a dizzying array of stars, unlike anything a human could have witnessed in this century or for most of the previous one, at least near an urban centre. The moon had not risen yet, and yet the streaming stars above offered sufficient light to see that he was in a gully that included a small watercourse along the bottom. Trees pressed in closely in every direction. He felt the lightning of adrenaline cause his heart to cease and then flutter, and momentarily pound from startlement when a tremendous hoot 
Oot, 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 sounded from the branches of the nearest forest giant. A screeching sound replied from further within the boughs and branches. Why, it sounded almost like, Ryan, Ry, Ry, Dimitri. And he shivered and then shuddered, his bones racking together painfully. Time to get help, he muttered. No sense sitting here freezing. His already quiet comments faded to mere thoughts. Wet spring. I remember the temperature on the screen above the speedometer, reading 79 Fahrenheit. At the spite of the storm, it was a warm evening. A warm front that caused the winds and rain and the flashes of lightning. And now it feels like late autumn or early winter. Freaky. He found his voice once more. It's like I've switched to another dimension or, or maybe another time. Definitely something odd. And a hoots sounded once more, and then something slid from the tree and flapped its way into the nightscape. It was large enough to create a star shadow as it passed over his head. He hunched momentarily, and then exhaled and forced himself to clamber to his feet. The only flashlight he had was integrated into his phone. He went back to his vehicle to search for the thing, but it had escaped him. The various detritus that had tended to collect in the vehicle was now strewn all over the entire interior space. I need a light to find my phone so I can have a light. He grumbled and then laughed at the absurd thought. He found the device wedged between the passenger seat and the center console. And he retrieved it, hopefully, and then saw that the screen was shattered. And then he saw that his finger bled from where he had cut it on the shards of the screen. The feeble light that emanated from within the once vivid wallpaper was now too faded to be of help to him, except in a total blackout. He didn't anticipate one of those, but he tucked the device into a pocket in case the tracking function might still work. I gotta keep dry or the insurance won't cover the damage. He assured himself of his firm reasoning. I wonder if they can track me or if I'm in another universe. He grinned to himself as he made his way down to the large creek Ah, not with my crappy service. Can't even get a signal downtown. While the water ran swiftly and swirls of the surface indicated a strong current, he decided that if he attempted to cross, he would have survived the crash only to drown. He turned upstream and struck out for a bridge or ford. Ah, maybe I just got down deeper near the bayou. Maybe got washed downstream. Bridge would be uh, this way, I think. Maybe sugar, a few jars off the shelf in my mind, as Granny used to say. He noted that the trees had grown even larger and incorporated tremendously thick trunks. The night noises had grown from impinging noises to a cacophony of bellows, roars, grunts, calls, screeches, and screams. At first, he held some hope that they were normal sounds from a nearby roadway and civilization, such as it was so close to an urban sprawl. Yet the sounds were definitely organic. Yes, that's the word I want. The other noises covered the first hints of a new set of sounds, but eventually he detected rustles in the underbrush. Something was following him. He kept perfect pace from within the verge on the upslope slide and a bit behind. If whatever it was attacked, his only escape route would be to run for the river, the deep and hard flowing river. He decided to temporarily slacken his speed to discover whether the party that followed him would slow as well. His walking pace reduced to an amble, and the rustling branches and leaves slackened their pace as well. He rapidly increased to a fast exercise pace. The rustles now included the thumps of heavy treads, as the thing that followed increased its speed to keep up with him. Dimitri became increasingly concerned. It hadn't attacked yet. He slowed back to his normal pace, the unseen tracker slowed with him, now panting heavily. He found that he too panted. The numbness in his arm had been replaced, at first with tingling, and now with a normal warmth and flow of blood within. He worked his arm vigorously for a moment to be sure that, should he need them, or they would properly function. Then he looked around for a weapon in the dimness. He had to maintain focus on the ground ahead to keep from tripping, and so he was able to keep an eye out for a handy fallen tree limb or a nice fat rock. Ah, figures, he spat. Nothing handy when it's needed. 
He noted that, for a moment after he spoke, the noises from his shadow had halted. He decided to try a new strategy. Hey, hey you, get out of here. Leave me alone or I'll call the police. He shouted strongly and pivoted to shout the last part towards his pursuer. There was a relative silence for a moment. The other nearby night noises ceased along with that rattling plant growth. And then a loud rustling commenced, the sounds of which rapidly diminished into the night. Dimitri smiled at his triumph over adversity and resumed his trek. He soon realized that there would be no bridge ahead, or there was nothing to indicate the intrusion of humankind into the wilderness that now surrounded him. He noted a yellowish hue that had entered the atmosphere, low on the horizon, and soon happily faded to silver as the moon rose above the tree line. And with the bright orb above, he was able to stride with more confidence. He realized that he had had to dodge many objects on the trail. He realized that he was definitely on the trail. Something, or more likely things, had trumped along the watercourse until there was a visibly clear pathway. Well, it had to have been fairly large, tall enough to crop some of the higher limbs above, as it meandered along, likely taking detours for drinks of water. I wonder what animal would be that tall, he said aloud, as much to keep the riotous sounds at bay as to express a congruent thought. At about that time, he tripped and nearly stumbled over an item on the ground. He caught his feet on the other side and turned to curse the object when it moved. It slivered forward along the ground and a large creature entered the water. It disappeared into the flow of the stream, sinuous curves and coils that went on for far too long. Dimitri watched, frozen in fear, and wondered. Hmm, must be an anaconda. In invasive species. Nothing else that big. He resumed muttering rather than speaking loudly. No point in drawing attention to myself. He decided silently. The enormous serpent, or whatever it had been, was gone, he hoped. Well, he was doing well enough on the exercise, not too tired, yet he was growing thirsty. Well, he shuddered. I'm not going near that river water. And presently, he encountered a small streamlet that led down towards the deeper flow. The water was surprisingly cold and tasted like it was fresh from a modern cooler. He drank his fill and sat beside the rivulet for a minute. He still didn't know where he was or what exactly had happened. He began walking on impulse, not his normal style. Still, he felt strongly that he was on the right path, quite literally. The cold water and the unexpected chill in the air brought on a desire for sleeves. A long sleeve shirt or a light jacket would be great. He pondered the non-existent items as he resumed his march upriver. The uproar of night noises had not calmed. The variety seemed to change to larger voices, in fewer voices. Ahead and down near the riverbank, he heard a hiss and a cough that reminded him of a steam train in an old movie. Similar emanations followed the initial versions as the air was filled with noises and then splashes and rustling brush as something ascended the bank in the night. An enormous something that scraped along the ground and thumped its peeds into the ground in a near charge. Dimitri feared that the charge was towards him, but a new horror emerged from a nearby bulls that ran beside the river trail. The trees and brush crashed aside as the lamb behemoth charged forward in answer to the challenge for the riverine beast. Dimitri thought at first that the trees, or at least their trunks, had come stomping to life on their own, and then he realized that what he saw was titanic, columnar legs that supported an enormous swaying gut that dangled just above his own height. He had no idea what the creature was, only that its head towered even above the bloated body. The creature from the dark waters reached him even as he attempted to take in the sight of tree legs, as he dubbed the forest giant. An armoured beast with a low slung head shuffled past him, its tail dragging behind. Others of its ilk followed. He knew that they were some type of crocodilians or maybe outsized monitor lizards far bigger than the Komodo dragons at the zoo. And he remained frozen as the parties met and clashed. But despite the additional light provided by the moon, he couldn't see much. The figures involved were too large for his limited field of vision to process. Something impacted his lower legs just below the knees, 
Perhaps some wagon tail or suddenly a displaced log sent flying. What concerned him was that when he impacted the ground, his breath fled from his lungs and he found himself tumbling towards the water. He came to a rasp with only his head in the water, his shoulders in the mud and muck along the bank, his chest turned upwards and heaving. He observed the opposite bank from the upside down perspective for a few moments. A large pair of red reflecting eyes beneath a beetling brow obscured his view, and he decided that he had had enough. He was no coward, but this was simply too much for a normal human mind to manage, and so he checked out for a while, and things went dark, just like after his crash. Well, he wasn't out for long. He could still hear the roars of rage and fear, and perhaps injury, from the trees above the top of the bank. The gargantuan struggle continued, its hideous combatants, nothing more than brief shadowy blurs of animalistic speed, backed by purpose. He rode onto his anterior and lifted his upper body to gain a better view. His new friend with the red eyes was not immediately visible, but new sets of eyes had appeared. Smaller, likely younger versions of the croco gators swam towards him, clearly in search of a meal. Dimitri was reasonably fit for a city dweller, but he found that in that moment of horror, he was able to leap to his feet and flee up on the river, following the mud and sand that lined the body of water, rather than climbing the bank. Then he recalled the enormous snake, even as he heard splashes and hisses behind him, along with smaller thumps and scrapes that those created by the creatures that had climbed the bank in pursuit of whatever the tall and fat thing had been. He jinked up the embankment so that he could peer over the top, yet not truly up there alongside the bigger monsters. The rustling of brush and the snapping of a set of jaws that contained peg-like teeth encouraged him to reach his personal all-time land speed record, despite the lopsided terrain. At the slight change in direction, he threw off his pursuers just enough that they seemed to come to the conclusion that there was easier prey to be had. They did not run well along a slope. They were designed to travel only up or down one. And by the time Dimitri's body informed him that he must slow or fall, long left his hungry followers and had made significant progress along his original trail. He slowed and cautiously observed the area above the top of the bank. Now he detected no immediate threats and the bank had begun to grow steeper anyway. And so he clambered above once again and searched for the trail he had followed. He could not find it. Apparently, at some point, it had either veered or outright turned from its original direction and into the forest. He considered backtracking, but the thought of the monsters caused him to shiver. The night had grown noticeably colder, but he was near an exhaustion, and his mouth and throat were dry as cotton. He forged his way through the brush that now impeded his progress beside the running water, until he discovered another clear stream from which to sleek his thirst. Then he looked around for a sheltered spot to rest. His stomach growled a little to remind him that he had not had no food for some time. Now, he didn't see any options. He always heard that it was dangerous to camp alongside flowing water in case of flash floods. Well, he was more concerned about the big lizards and hefty snakes. Probably leeches and piranha in the nasty water. Not to mention flesh-eating bacteria and disease. He spoke aloud seeking comfort in the only human voice available. He examined the trees. None was large enough to avoid the attentions of the big, fat, long legged beastie, but he says that it had likely been a herbivore. He would definitely find no safety on the ground. He soon spied a tree that was not exceptionally tall, but it branched nicely. He should be able to climb it and lodge himself in a crotch between three limbs that continued to rise, it was below the level of the treetop gazer and above the reach of the swimmer crawlers. Uh, probably. He hoped that they could climb no better than regular gators and crocs. He managed to get into an ice fork and settle in more comfortably than he had imagined possible. The ambient noises that had assaulted his ears since uh, his arrival, he decided to call it a calm slightly. And they were still present, but it seemed that many creatures had either eaten or been eaten, and no longer joined in an orchestra of madness that had haunted his perceptions with the music of death, dismemberment, and devouring. 
he began to consider his situation. Where he was. Perhaps when he was. Oh, this place appeared much like an archaic earth. And then he slept. His dreams were punctuated by even greater horrors than he had experienced when waking. The imaginary beast that came to eat his dream self loomed large and gore-soaked. His dream self was impotent when it came to challenging their intentions. He ran as he had while awake. He felt thorns shred his flesh and sting and burn. Hot breath assaulted him from behind, and he turned to feebly attempt to stave off his impending status as a meal. And then he awakened, screaming in extreme pain and discomfort from several places on his body all at once. He all but fell from the tree in his haste to reach the ground, and there he rolled in the dirt, yet the biting and stinging insects continued their assault. And finally, with no other resource to halt the attack, he rolled down the bank and into the muddy water. It was a rapid roll. The bank was steep, and he ended up further out in the current than he had intended. If he had truly intended anything other than to escape the misery that his body had become. He found his feet and began to strip off his clothing and toss it up onto the shoreline. At last, he was able to view the members of the attacking force. Some kind of large stinging ants. They were bigger than any insects he'd ever seen. At least in person. They had red bodies and bright yellow heads. He noted one on his arm that had latched onto his flesh with its mandibles, and now worth the stinger on its tail, in a painful dance that burrowed almost as deeply as the tiny jaws. Ants with a tail? His subconscious interrupted his agony for a brief interval. They appeared to be some kaleidoscopic amalgamation of ant, scorpion, and spider. He slapped off the offending subject, and then slapped and scratched, and rubbed at each of the others he could reach. He ducked himself below the surface of the water and continued his contortions until he could feel no more bites and stings or creeping of little feet. When he finally rose and spluttered, he found that he had drifted even further into the stream. He was moving back down river. Away from my clothes, he spat as he struck out swimming for the shore. He made it. The river current was strong but slow, and he found that his clothes had been invaded and he ended up dunking them in the murky water to remove the last of the trespassers. He hoped, vengefully, that they could not swim. Well, it did not matter. His body was on fire with the wounds he had suffered. He dragged his damp garments and miserable carcass up above the edge of the embankment and collapsed on soft, cool grass. He could no longer see the moon. How much longer will this night last? He called to the sky with its bright myriad of stars that displayed the Milky Way in all of its glory. Am I still in the Milky Way? He shivered and lay in abject misery, flesh feeling as though he had been stung by a hundred cigarettes all at once. And somehow he managed to doze. When he awakened, it was to the continued burn and itch that inflamed his skin. He felt hot and chilled all at once and knew that he was feverish. He wondered whether the insect bites contained some type of venom. Probably just my luck, he slurred. His tongue was swollen and his eyes gummy. He felt a little out of breath. He located the stream from which he drunk during the hours of darkness. And when he managed to pay attention for a moment, he noted that the gloom had faded from black to a slate grey. Well, it wasn't much of a change, only enough to notice. He rolled onto his back, weak and in no condition, to condition his headlong flight to. Hmm. Nowhere, he mumbled. He opened his eyes to the glare of sunlight as it threaded through a perfect pathway between leaves and branches and found its way into the right eye to bore into his brain. He rolled onto his side and slurped at the water once more. He kept his eyes closed. They were gummier than ever. When he pried them open, he saw that another party had joined him for a morning drink. They were red deer, speckled with the greenish-yellow spots. They were normal-sized, as far as he knew. The largest peered at him, prepared to leap away to safety, should he pose a threat. The others took turns, watching, as the big one took its turn drinking. Once they were each satisfied, they pranced away into the depths of the green wall of vegetation. Good thing for you, I feel like crap. Stupid deer. I'd eat you. 
His voice was back to mumbles and slurs, and a weak and weary feeling eventually enveloped him, and so that he slept, despite the pain, the stinging, the burning, the fever, and the profound chill. His last conscious thought came unbidden and unwanted, yet true to how he felt at that moment. Oh, if I die before I wake, thanks. When he again awakened, the sunlight was gone, replaced not by darkness, but simple cloudy gloom. He lay still for a long while, blinking occasionally, his eyelids feeling like sandpaper, his throat parched and tongue beginning to swell with thirst. Great, nothing ate me in my sleep. I'm starting to be afraid that I won't die. He slivered to the little, life-cold stream and gulped so much water that most of it came choking back and left him and even more misery, with the working of his sore muscles. When he was done, and the racking coughs had faded, he took another drink, a slow one. He discovered that it made it to an uncomfortable kneeling position. Guess it beats an uncomfortable laying one, he grasped, and with his body attended as best as he was able, he attempted to engage his mind by observing his surroundings in the now feeble and watery light of day. He saw and heard no exceptional threats from the crowding trees of the forest. And when he looked at a river, his heart leapt. It was a major body of water. In the moon and starlight, he assumed that he had simply been unable to see the other side that was cloaked in darkness. Now he could see it. A distant, opposite bank, covered in swirling mist, and with a dark outline beyond. Definitely not the river I was about to cross when that... He trailed off and shook his head in an attempt to clear it. Instead, it brought on waves of dizziness and nausea. Stupid ant scorpion spiders. He cursed the insectoid army that had easily won victory over his mass. Maybe it's a lake. I think they down the river above the city. My memory is foggy as that opposite shore. He was back to mumbling. With no better trail and no desire to backtrack, he forged ahead along the side of the now impossibly wide river. The noises of the previous night had become muted and merged with birdsong, yet they persisted. Life, and the ending thereof, just beyond the verge and out of sight. The birds were sometimes pleasant sounding, but most were raucous in their calls. Buzzes and crows, no doubt, carrion eaters. He shivered which hurt his sore body. He knew that he needed food. His stomach no longer rumbled. It had lost the capacity. His pace was slow and stumbling. He couldn't decide if it was hunger or venom or fatigue, but he was weakening swiftly. Then the rustling resumed. The sounds that had haunted his track at the outset resumed. Maybe. These sounds like something a much larger creature would make. They lacked the slight thumping quality of the previous scraping gate. They padded like a predator. He soon caught a whiff of carnivore stench from the woods to the one side. He decided that yelling would not likely stop whatever the beast was. He searched desperately for some type of weapon. There weren't even rocks to throw, at least not on top of the bank. He realized. He then searched for an access to the river down the now tall and steep boundaries the shoreline. The rustling increased in volume and frequency, and he found himself plunging down from above and impacting the cold water. His feet encountered a muddy bottom sooner than he expected, and he fell forward. A roar sounded from above, and a larger splash doused him with a heavy wave. His pursuer had leapt out much farther than he had. Dimitri made his way to his feet in the shallows. The water rose no higher than his kneecaps. He desperately wiped at his face and eyes to clear his vision. A bulky form bobbed at the surface. It swam for a moment and then clearly rested its feet on the bottom. It was large enough to do so in water that would be well over his head. Indeed, the shaggy, slimy pate that rose above the surface was very large. Too large, his poor, tortured senses informed him. The cranium was broad and heavy with thick jowls that promised enormous biting force. The lower jaw rested beneath the surface, but the bite radius would be impressive as well. 
Dmitri had no idea what the creature might be. It huffed out a foul, reeking breath that bubbled and frothed the water. It then began to surge towards him. His body, given the primal options of flight, fight or freeze, selected a worst alternative. He froze where he stood. The charge of the beast, only just begun, halted just as suddenly. A beak-like mouth, edged with serrated teeth, that clamped onto the rear portion of its body, possibly on a leg or tail. The monster battered its outrage and pain, and whirled faster than anything that size should be able to. It gaped to expose its fangs and slammed its open maw onto a long, sinuous neck that was attached to the head and beak, and presumably an enormous submerged torso. Dimitri, at last freed from the spell that had left him bound and awaiting death, selected a better option and fled. And the benefits of the option soon failed. He reached the steep wall of mud and clay and could not climb the slippery slope. He soon found himself coated with a viscous orange-red gunk from which the nearby landscape was formed. He desperately searched with his eyes to find a place to climb. The combatants in the water continued their titanic struggle. He was afraid to watch. He knew in his heart that whichever won, or he would be the next mill. He found an elderly log for the tree that had long ago tumbled over the edge of the short cliff, as though it had been toppled just for his needs. He glanced back over his shoulder, and while he couldn't be sure, it looked as though the beaked terror might be gaining an advantage over the wide gaping horror. He turned back to his task and prepared to climb like a squirrel. He stepped on a rock to give himself a boost, but the rock shifted and slipped into the river. Legs, a tail, and a head emerged from the rock, and it transformed into a very large turtle. Dimitri now sat in the mud, legs spread and hands sunk to his elbows, and barked out a laugh. He followed it with a more uproarious and inappropriate jocularity until he finally had to stop to catch his breath. He looked over to where the monsters had been so vigorously engaged only moments earlier. The water had grown as still as running water did. A large portion of it had darkened with crimson. A lean, hairy belly flopped to the surface, long legs disappearing into the depths on one side. At least three of them were. The fourth was at the moment sliding down the long gully, well past the beak and on its way to an invisible stomach below the surface. The head of the dead beats had turned so that it faced into the channel and away from Dimitri's view. Oh, he was relieved. Oh, he was relieved. He made his way to his feet, and with a wary eye on the feeding, riverine nightmare, he cleaned some of the slippery ooze from his arms and hands, and then resumed his scramble to safety. He continued along the difficult pathway that he had forged for himself until he came to a dip at the bottom of which was a clear, flowing creek. He made his way down to the water's edge and drank greedily, but carefully. He found a deep spot at the bend in the course and washed away as much of the crusted mud as he was able. He was wearing out quickly and decided that following the trail less riverbank was leading him nowhere. He determined to change direction and follow the creek. He was cold. The shadows below these fairly low and gently sloping banks were deep. However, though it must be getting on towards evening, he noticed that the light had increased slightly. He continued for a way, and then ascended the bank opposite the one he descended earlier. The tree cover had thinned substantially, and he could see clearings covered in grass, peeping from beyond the balls. He had no way to know whether they were natural clearings or something created by intelligent hands. He didn't care. The trees had become oppressive, and so he plunged ahead and soon found himself in a large meadow. Well, there were more trees beyond it, yet they possessed a different quality. There were no sense of impending doom lurking beneath their gentle canopies. He hadn't proceeded far into the meadowland when he noticed several heads that rose, appeared, and then disappeared. Each face gazed at him in curiosity and concern. They were large heads with lumpy, elongated faces. He tried to ignore them and hoped desperately that they were grass grazers and not given to trampling trespassers. He passed and the heads popped up less frequently. On his other side he saw dark humped ridges that parted the tall grasses 
from which snorts and grumbled noises arose. More herbivores, please, he pleaded internally, afraid to make a noise. And shortly past the halfway point in his crossing, he darted a glance down one side at a new tree line. Grazing from the treetops, he saw something that may have been the same type of beast that had loomed in the night. The legs were the same, columnless shafts that supported wide swaying bellies. Next was far above what looked to be armor like that of a rhinoceros. Dimitri shook his head in wonder. He could not believe that even the enormous crocodilians could take down such a creature. And when he finally approached the area where the grasses thinned and the trees became once again more frequent, he realized just how exhausted he was. The sun was sinking fast and he could not think of a place to shelter. He caught a glimpse deep within the woods, dancing sparkles that hinted of diamonds, and he plunged ahead, making his legs work on sheer will. He wasn't sure why, but he knew it had to be something. And the diamonds were soon joined by sapphires and rubies, a veritable treasure trove of shining jewels. As the grey slate of night began to descend, he found himself once more on the shoreline of the river. Other shapes and forms milled about, human forms. He realized with glee. They gathered around a pier and gazed out at a vessel that approached. The vessel was black against the slate gray sky. And darkest of all was the helmsman who steered the vessel directly towards them. Shadowy crew moved about and performed the task necessary to make a ship perform. I think I must be dreaming again, Dimitri mumbled. And one of the folks lined up along the dock turned to him featured pale and sallow in the murkiness. The man looked, hmm, dead. Dimitri decided, but then the lips moved and words emerged. You dream no more, young one. It is indeed Karen himself who arrives to ferry us to the far shore. Ah, confirm. Subject is deceased. Ah, oh, man, it's awful. Guardrail split off the entire left side. Instant exsanguination. Witness said she saw a big red rig that swerved into the lane in front of him. No idea where it went afterwards. Ah, poor guy. Assuming of course that the registered owner was driving. Could have been someone that borrowed the car. State Trooper Sandra Briggs chatted as part of her means to process the stress. And Officer Bill Stratton from the City Police Department laughed as part of his response to the same stressors. Heck, sanguine nation. Who you kidding? You got that fancy damn word from the medical examiner's office? And Trooper Briggs eyed him askance. Yep, I did. Point is, he died on impact. Or so close as to make no difference. Uh, who gets to notify the family? And the red, white and blue emergency lights flashed and sparkled in the soft rainfall in the background. Wow, 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 wow. Certainly another one. Wow. What a heartbreaking story with an impending doom filling throughout. From the incredible mind of our good friend, Michael G. Lockhart. A humongous thank you to you, Michael, for your patience and continued support. Your imagination always takes us on such incredible adventures. As ever, I hope you enjoyed this rendition. And I will be trying to put more time aside this week to record some of your other longer stories. I hope you're well and happy and look forward to the next adventure. Well, guys and girls, as ever, you know the drill. Please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. Well, it really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. If you'd like to get in touch or compare the next big hit, then please do so at the contact email, which is as on screen. Contact the dead one at gmail.com. I really look forward to hearing from you. Guys and girls, I have such a massive back catalogue of amazing stories and adventures from Michael. Really trying my best to get my way through them. And I got a feeling we'll be doing a Michael Lockhart weekend very, very soon. 
Please do bear with me as I try to work out juggling work around three kids and tidying and cleaning in the school room. And please do know that I appreciate all of your kind comments, your likes and shares. You guys make this channel what it is. Of course, I hope you're all well and happy, fighting fit, and are making the most of the beautiful summer sunshine with friends or family. But above all guys, remember, be safe, not sorry. He switched on his wipers with the rain that had threatened for most of this journey. He switched on his wipers with the rain that had threatened to. Come on, fam. On a large frame, rolled directly towards him. He could now make out a red cab. He felt the lightning of adrenaline. He felt the lightning of adrenaline courses. He felt the lightning of adrenaline cause his heart to cease and then flutter momentarily pound from startlement when a tremendous hoot he felt the lightning he felt the lightning of adrenaline cause his heart to cease and then flutter and for momentarily pound from a settlement blah, 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 blah. And by the time Dimitri's body informed him that he must slow or fall he had long left his hungry followers and had made significant process fuck you his body given the primal options of flight fight or freeze selected the worst alternative he froze where he stood. The charge of the beast I had only fuck you. He made his way to his feet, and with a wary eye on the feeding riverine 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 Instant insanguination. Witness said she saw a big red rig that swerved into the lane in front of him. No idea where it went afterwards. Poor guy. Assuming of course that the registered owner was driving. Could have been someone who borrowed the car. State trooper son. Oh, fucking hell, it's a woman. <laughs>